are now most well known for is being one of the Dirty Dozen watch manufacturers, which were the 12 watch manufacturers that made watches for the British towards the end of the Second World War. And Verdict were the only British one of them. It allows us to tell the story in a slightly different way. And it's something we're very proud of. And when I restarted Vertex seven years ago, no one was telling the Dirty Dozen story. It was very unknown. If you Googled Vertex, there wasn't a lot to find out about it. Um, and now obviously it's completely changed. And obviously Vertex has returned with his homage to its own watch. And, and then about 30 other manufacturers have decided that that's the story they want to tell as well. There's a lot of people which, jumped on that bandwagon which is, now. Which is awesome. <laughs> Hi everybody, welcome to the Watch Gecko YouTube channel with myself, Richard. Today we have a very special guest. We have Don Cochran, who's the owner of Vertex. Now we've just recently bought some Vertex watches. We were hugely impressed with them. So we're very, very lucky to have Don with us today. Don, thank you so much for giving up some time. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And you've brought uh, an almost overwhelming collection <laughs> of watches, which uh, is is superb. I mean, I can see here Vertex is from every era. Yeah, well, we, we are nothing if not diverse. So we obviously Vertex was founded in 1912 by my great grandfather. They did many, many things until the 70s when they were taken down by the quartz crisis, like many other watch brands. But what I brought today sort of slightly represents a little bit of that story. They're absolutely superb. I mean, I'm struggling to to make eye contact with you because they're here. You briefly touched on the, the company history. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, you're a third generation so, owner of the company. Yeah, absolutely. So founded by my great-grandfather, Claude Lyons. Then my grandfather, Henry, took over uh, in the 40s. And then uh, he ran it until um, 1972 when uh, it closed down, partly due to the courts crisis mm. and uh, partly due to our lease on our factory in Hatton Garden had come up and my grandfather wanted to retire and that was right. what, what happened. If we step back to right at the beginning, because it's such an interesting story and off camera we were talking about how the story behind watches is so important. It's a really integral part of the, the ethos of a watch. How did your great grandfather get into the industry to begin with? Yeah, well, I mean, he I I never met him, sadly, so I've never heard it firsthand. Mm -hmm. And obviously, while my grandfather was alive, Vertex wasn't something well, I was very aware of Vertex was very much part of our, our history, but it wasn't something we spent a lot of time talking about, which is a shame because now that'd be really useful information. But my great grandfather he first started out with a company called Dreadnought Watches, which he ran in the UK. During the First World War, just before the First World War, he started Vertex. And I'm not sure why that happened, why there was a a deflection at that point. Um, Dreadnought and Vertex ran um, together for a while, but then he just concentrated on Vertex. Vertex obviously originally started as a civilian watchmaker, mm. um, 1912, but then obviously the First World War came along and they kind of quickly moved into supplying watches for, for military personnel, even though um, the military itself wasn't at that point really buying watches. So it would be more like a civilian would buy the watch to take on tour. Right. Um, on disbursement or whatever happened. Majority of them were pocket watches and it's only towards the end of the First World War that, that men started wearing wrist watches. But um, that was sort of happened during that period. I mean, this is obviously, just so that people can get into contact, context, this is prior to what we would call bespoke military watches being developed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it would, so it would just be family watches, yeah, literally. Absolutely. And and quite often it would be a gift from a loved one to take yeah. to the front and that sort of thing. And, and there was a beautiful story that a lady wrote to my great-grandfather saying um, that her son had written from the front and it was done all this stuff um, that was going on. But he was saying the only good thing that happened to him or the only good thing he did every day was to wind his watch, mm -hmm. which I think that that sort of that personalization of, of your timepiece and, and the fact that yeah. winding a watch does make it go, it's a very pure thing to do yeah. Um, was yeah it's amazing it makes me quite kind of goosebumpy you know I, I i i can't even begin to tell you how much i identify with that and i'm going to run the risk of digressing and maybe ending up on the edit room floor um the, the explorer 2 that i'm wearing at the moment yeah. I, I used to travel the world all the time in various horrible places and um i always kept the the red hand on home time yeah and it was nothing to do with a oh, what time to call home it was just the hand to my mind pointed to home yeah so that's, that's why yeah. this watch has a really special connection to me and I completely empathize with the yeah. the hand wound story. Yeah. And then obviously after the First World War, lots of civilian watches. We did a huge number of much more female focused watches, platinum, diamond, um, wristlets and cocktail watches. 
gentleman's watches, half hunter uh, mm. pocket watches like that one there. These two watches here are in 1920s, very much that sort of Art Deco 1920s look. And it was a fun period for watchmaking and, and case making and a lot of interesting things got done during that point. 1939 rolls around. By this time, we're supplying the MOD. We're doing ATP watches. We're making ATP watches for the military. We're doing um, more bespoke watches for certain mm. parts of the military. But obviously, all British manufacturing slowly turns towards munitions and that sort of thing. So we became much more military focus and what we are now most well known for is being one of the dirty dozen watch manufacturers which were the 12 night watch manufacturers that made watches for the british towards the end of the second world war and most importantly the first time the british really defined what they wanted a, a military watch to be um so these 12 watch manufacturers were Jaeger, Lakuto, Omega, Longines, IWC. So some pretty big hitters in mm, today's market. Sure. And Vertex were the only British one of them. It allows us to tell the story in a slightly different way. And it's something we're very proud of. And it's something that's given us a lot of relevance as we re-entered the market. Obviously, since we've when I when I restarted Vertex um, seven years ago, no one was telling the Dirty Dozen story. It was very unknown. If you Googled Vertex, there wasn't a lot to find out about it um, and now obviously it's completely changed and obviously Vertex has returned with its um, its homage to its own watch and IWC Longines have created their own versions mm -hmm. of that watch again um, and then about 30 other manufacturers have decided that that's a story they want to tell as well. There's a lot of people which, jumped on that bandwagon <laughs> which, is, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> other watches to, are available. To, to also but, whether you'd want homage, to buy them is another matter. Also pay homage to that yeah. story. And it's also interesting just to see how it's affected the second hand value of, of WWW watches. You know, when I restarted Vertex, you could buy a Second World War Vertex for three, four hundred pounds, and now it's two thousand to three thousand pounds. So it's interesting to see just how that's changed in the seven years. If you can find started. me one for two or three hundred pounds, please do. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think it's really interesting. Again, it's something we were chatting about earlier. That um, one of the things I, I do here is I write a lot about the military watches, and I've always been fascinated how, at a particular point in history during World War Two, both the US and the British decided they needed to have a purpose-built watch. Yeah, and the specs are. Well, I suppose like everything between the US and the UK is similar but different. Yeah. And uh, they went down a particular route. The Dirty Dozen went down a particular route. Um, how much research have you done into the specs that you're... This would be your grandfather now. Uh, obviously, my great-grandfather was running the company at the time. My grandfather was doing requisitions for the army. So he, right. uh, he as far as I'm aware, he was quite involved in this project and, and working between, obviously, because he knew Switzerland, because we produced our movements in, in Switzerland. He had very good connections there, et cetera, et cetera. So um, he was very involved. Again, I only wish I'd asked him some more questions. Oh, I know. I, um, I hear it's, you. it's very frustrating. You know, realistically, the British and, and the Americans did come up with very similar designs. The main difference being that the Americans went for a centre second mm. and the British went for a sub second. There is an argument that sub second is easier to read. That's certainly what the British believed. It's a slightly more complicated movement, so it's slightly hard to make. Mm. But at the same time, it was very much what Europe was making at the time. European movements were mainly mm. sub-second at the time. So whereas American movements kind of became yeah, centre-second movements. Sure. So maybe that's something to do with it too. Yeah. But the specification was black dial, white Arabic numerals, luminosity, water resistant, perspex case or glass, sorry, and shock proof. And that's kind of what they're all built around. They're all pretty similar, but they're, none of them are identical. So all 12 It's lovely when you different. see all 12. Yeah. I've only ever seen a photograph of all 12 yeah. together. I've never been lucky enough yeah. to see 12 together. And obviously the, within the 12, the least well-made and the, the least numerous one was a Grania. And that's the most expensive one now because they didn't make many. And not many didn't survive. So, how many of those were made? Do you think? Well, it's it, it's it's sort of unknown, but it's less than two thousand, they think. And probably there's uh, who knows how many are available in the world. I've I know of about sixty, and those watches sell for twenty five thousand pounds. Yeah, sixty. Yeah. Gosh. Uh, so they sell for twenty five thousand pounds. Whereas an uh, Jaeger Lacouture, which I think is the nicest one of them, uh, that would be more like three to four thousand pounds. So yeah. it's it's really scarcity that defines so the market. When you, obviously, because you're so integrated into the Vertex, I just wonder when you've handled other dirty dozen watches, do you feel a DNA commonality or do they genuinely feel like different products? I mean, some are very similar. So the, the, some within the dirty dozen are very similar. And whether we share dial makers, I don't know, or, you know, sometimes the hands will be different, but the dial will be the same or the. Mm there'll be some differences um, at that level. Um, some are very different. So the Omega 
the angular couture are very different the movements they use are very different the finish is very different the case material is different the size of the watch is even a tiny bit different but within that they're, they're very similar so do you know how many vertex were made for world war ii and have you any idea who they may have been issued to or or where they may have turned up yeah i mean i know um from our records that the watches were delivered the first watch was delivered in 1944 just before d-day that was what they were sort of created for i don't know how many or what units they went to because wow. very sadly in 1976 there was a fire at the royal singles core in a building that stored all this information and obviously we hadn't digitized records in those days nothing happened so it's a very frustrating kind of black hole of information there's a certain amount of information we get from the swiss manufacturers because obviously they kept their records mm. but at the same time their records were sort of um kept in a specific way because they were Play, making watches for both sides and they didn't want to piss anyone off so it's 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 very difficult to understand what was sent where from them either so it's a frustrating black hole that we're constantly trying to fill um so if anyone who's listening to this has any information we'd appreciate it thank you please write in we'd really like to know um yeah no it's really interesting because one of the things i wanted just to explore briefly with you is that we, we were we've just recently reviewed a modern iteration of the american a11 which yeah. we thought somebody done a pretty decent job of and it's the the cultural impact of these watches on modern watches, because I think there's a compelling argument that without the Dirty Dozen collection, Vertex being one, yeah. or even the American watches, we wouldn't have the modern day field watch. Yeah. Because there are certain designs. If, if, for example, um, we were going out to make a field watch today as a company, um, we would be looking at very, very clear design specifications, which would translate roughly back to what was created under those military specifications. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, Vertex's motto is purity of purpose, which is really how military watches were divine, designed or military timepieces or any military ordinance. It's basically it's designed to do a job. Mm -hmm. It's how can we make that thing function the best it possibly can be, be as robust as possible, in this case, tell the time mm -hmm. accurately under low light conditions or, or high light conditions or whatever condition you're in and allow the wearer to make a definitive decision based on that timepiece. Mm. And that purity of person, purpose is something that we try to maintain within the brand, but it's definitely what you get from this thing. And it's why people love watches that are designed to do a job uh, rather than just, absolutely. just to look it's, like it's a thing. It's the ultimate tool watch, yeah, really. It, it, absolutely. it is. I, I completely agree. And uh, as we were alluding to earlier, um, before we were on camera, that in all of our jobs, one of the great joys is is coming across a watch that's more than the sum of its parts. Yeah. And, and I think there are certain watches that really, really do fall into that category. And I think probably well, any of the Dirty Dozen, for example, do that. Yeah. The Vertexes have hopefully, with their owners, survived the war. Yeah. What happened then? Because certainly looking at your company history on your website, it yeah. was a... Was it, is it a flat point, would you call it? Well, no. So first of all, WWW Vertex Watches went on to serve for another 30, 40 years within the British military. I mean, oh, do you know so, how long? There might well, have been some I mean, apparently there was, there was still some in the 80s being used. Um, so, but realistically, 1967 is when they were meant right. to be phased out. Okay. But you know how things work. So they, they still had a life and they still had residence and a presence in the world. But Vertex, because we were a British based manufacturer after the Second World War, we were restricted by rationing. So we were only allowed to import a certain number of movements into the UK from Switzerland that really defined what we could produce. So there was no money in producing military watches. We had to move to civilian watches because mm. we could only produce a few. So from that point on, we were much more a civilian watchmaker. And although we made sports watches and dive watches and that sort of thing, it was really for the civilian market. But that's not such a bad thing. All those watches also had amazing stories and were part of people's lives and were their 21st birthday present mm -hmm. or their retirement present or, you know, the watch they took traveling and uh, and that sort of thing. So I still meet people that are like, oh, I, you know, this is my, I've just discovered this watch that was in my family all this time. And, you know, that's all amazing. If you come to our, our residence in, in Mayfair, which is where, where we're based, you'll see 200 pictures of, of, our heritage collection of, of Vertex watches. And each one of those has a story. And each one of those, I think, gives us authority to sort of tell that story, which is very precious to us. 1972 comes along, like I mentioned, the quartz crisis really decimated the, the Swiss watch market and the British watch market. Suddenly you had very cheap, accurate quartz watches. There was no love for mechanical watches at the time. It really lost momentum. My grandfather wanted to retire. That factory in Hatton Garden, the lease had come up and so he decided to close it down. And and that's kind of what happened. I grew up with stories of, of Vertex watches and we still had 
lots of them and i used to draw watches with my grandfather because as a kid round circle with some hands on it is a really easy thing to do and yeah sure. and he'd play with that and 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 he'd take them apart and put them back together for me and that was all fascinating wonderful but it was never it never even occurred to me that it was it would ever be a part of my life and then um seven years ago um my grandmother died claude's daughter she'd always been a massive part of my life and i was sitting at work feeling very sad about it and i suddenly thought wouldn't it be cool to bring her father's watch company back just to keep her in my life as a cathartic thing not as a commercial thing at all and then i started digging into vertex really for the first time by this time i'm you know in my 40s and i sort of fall in love with that dirty dozen story myself mm. and i think well that that seems like a story that should be told and why don't i try and do that and that's what i tried to do and that's kind of how vertex came back so we launched with the m100 which was a uh, my homage to our our www very honest to that original specification but modernized um it doesn't have a date it does have a large sub second it does have a a cup seven and five it's it's i think i uh, have to argue with anyone about it the most honest reiteration of one of the data dozen watches whilst being larger in format at the same time superluminova had started a new technology which is a molded superluminova and because luminosity was such an important part of what second world war watches or war watches anyway i thought wouldn't that be uh, interesting to play with and it's actually sort of become our signature now um, people really love how well it works and against that purity of purpose it actually functions brilliantly well and mm. um, it also adds a dimension to the dial which is fascinating and it's been you know it's been lovely to see how people ha have has resonated with people yeah i was really interested in that when i was um thinking about you coming in today about how you've got this incredible historical watch that is is in that iconic collection you want to create a new version of that, but stay true to the original. Was there any point in your mind where you thought about simply releasing a, a watch as pair of the 1944 yeah. one? I mean, the, the, we, there was, and there's still pressure to do that. It was interesting for me, my design experience of the M100 really went full circle, whereas at the beginning, I really wanted to push us a, a bit further away from the original watch and modernize it further and and you know there was definitely a center second version there was a date version there was a whole bunch of other iterations but the longer i spent spent with the original watch the more i fell in love with it really mm. and the, the more i realized the only thing i had to do was just be as true to that as possible i'm a big believer that you're only as good as the sum of your parts and so the, the watch itself had to be as good as it could be mm. so when i was once i found our manufacturing partner there was never a conversation as as can we make that a bit cheaper or where can we save some money? It's like, is this the best component we can use at this point? And is this the best? And is this the best? And you like the box crystal on this watch is is the best you can have in the market. It's the Rolls Royce of crystal and that sort of thing. It's just, I wanted it to be perfect. The inside of the watch, I mean, you can't, can't see it. It's a closed case back, but it's um, the top execution of that movement. So it's rhodium, it's blue screws, It's it's got a ratchet wheel, which is this copy of our original vertex ratchet wheel so it says vertex in it and it's all no one sees that but i want you to know it's in there because that's really important to me yeah sure um and that's that's all part of how it evolves so were there any design criteria you thought in order to make this this is 2015 correct mm -hmm. in order to make this viable today were there any must have must have must haves or did you was it more of a it was much more organic the process yeah. um it was you know I mean, it's it's funny being here, having a conversation with you, because when I started out, I bought God knows how many watch straps from you guys, uh, experimenting on, on on what it should look like, and that's. I mean, at that point, I had a, a case prototype, a paper dial case prototype. So it was a case with a paper printout dial of what the watch should look like, and a probably a perspex crystal, and then I I'd, I'd experiment with different straps different strap colors that sort of thing so you were very much instrumental part of that original uh, well, we development are process we are truly honored <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm sure i'm not the only watchmaker that will say that about you i still got you know dozens of little prototypes of how this works and Ooh. prototypes don't always work out i've got a whole there's the m60 which we might discuss in a second yeah. our dive watch there's a whole prototype series of of what could have been that watch that never mm. and never just didn't work so it's just been put away how many of these did you initially then set out to make so 600 at the beginning right. I, th I thought 600 would be a good number to i don't know why i think the, the minimum order quantity to work with the factory that i was working with was 500 watch watches okay. ordered and i felt i should try and be more optimistic than that so mm -hmm. i ordered 600 okay and that's an expensive way to do a thing because you basically give them a lot of money and then wait a year and a half 
for that to come back as a product that you can then sell and then you have to try and find a market for it and that sort of thing you know i remortgaged our house my wife was very understanding <laughs> and off, off we went on that adventure at the same time you know you you make thousands of little decisions that, that are important and that you know the case as we made for the watch are pelly cases so mm -hmm. i love pelly cases as a part of our uh, military history but they're also robust so you can ship the watch anywhere in the world and um, they reflect the brand well all that kind of thing but they're not hugely cheap either no they're um, not. so that that was the decision we made the little manual that comes with the watch the spine of it in fact uh, is is singer stitched which was very much reflective of how they produce material during that period of time so right. those details loads of little details that you make decisions about all the yeah. time when you take delivery of the m100a as we did here in the office yeah. I'm a great believer in that there should be a journey to get to a watch. And there are a couple of brands out there that I've, I've said very openly, I think, do a cracking job of it. Yeah. Um, one, for example, was Marlowe. I think right. their, their journey to their watch is superb, and I've been quite open about that. But yours, the only thing I was missing was, uh, I don't know, a, a letter from M telling yeah. me what my mission was. It's, I mean, obviously you've gone through, I mean, m much as we can smile about it, yeah. and it's a wonderful process to go through the, the diplomatic bag, which yeah. I've, gosh, I've lugged a few of those around in my yeah. time, through to the, the Pelly case, uh, through to the, 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 there was a lovely letter that came with it. And the, the, it was so well crafted and conceived, the journey into the watch. Yeah. That I, I, certainly for me as a watch enthusiast perspective, I, I would want to say on behalf of anybody who owns one, it was a really good job well done. Yeah. How did you come up with that thought process of making a journey to the watch? I, I don't know. I mean, it it just it's just. I mean, I think one of the core parts of the whole Pelly case thing is, I'm so I have a couple of nice watches I got before I started this journey, and I kind of resent that you, they come in these beautiful boxes that you open the watch, you take the watch out, you put the box back in its box inside the box mm. and put it in a cupboard and never ever see it again but you have to store that the rest we've of your all life done it because it's important yeah. the thing i love about these cases is you can if you want now use that yeah. for anything else you take the watch out you can take the foam out and that's now a, a very rugged waterproof box yeah um and that was an important part of the original thought process and then we've we've become very good friends with penny now because we buy a lot of their cases so this for instance this m60 case is a their new it's called a rock case um and it's sort of rubberized it's it's got a cool feeling to it you just kind of want to touch uh, it it's, it's good <laughs> oh, yeah. um and then you just kind of work through that process so i i i I love them you know whether we'll always have penny cases i don't know but they're they're a good part of our story and then there's, it's just, you just, once you start, you just, what else can you do? So well, it's kind of hard to step whenever, back from yeah. that now though. That's the problem because yeah, sure. you set a precedence of what, what, if I ordered an M60, yeah. I have an expectation of how that watch is going to arrive. Yeah. And I think it is the complete antithesis to say one of the great, uh, I think we're allowed to say it, gaffes of the watch industry would be the enormous um, attache case that yeah. the Omega Speedmaster came in where you look at it and think, why? Yeah. I mean, yeah. what were they thinking? Yeah. Whereas this is eminently practical. Yeah, well, that's that purity of purpose thing again. And, yeah. and like, for instance, here, this is it's called a kit tag, um, which they use in the military to put on your bag or your med kit or whatever. Mm. And so it made sense to have one with your serial number um, on the ah, So on that's here. unique to the watch. That, yeah, that's this that's one. That's wonderful. Number. That's a good serial number. Isn't it though? Like, well, it's um, an FN, by the way, was the other little, there's so many little things. Um, yeah. So dreadnought is Latin. It means fear nothing. So all our serial numbers are FN, which is fair nothing. Fair nothing. <laughs> Sold. But I <laughs> So let's just assume that we, we were so excited by our M100A that we're desperate to move on and buy something else. Yeah. Um, we've just taken possession of an Aqualine. Yes. This little fella, yeah. So tell me a little bit about the the, the evolution or, or the, the huge transition from yeah. Dirty Dozen Inspired Field Watch into okay, so, um, Dive. We, we didn't go straight there. We came here first. So this is the MP45 right. Money Pusher chronograph. So this is a, I love Money Pushers. And this is an interesting story in itself because we were commissioned to make this um, in 1944. But then the war finished, and then because of um, rationing, we didn't. So we were actually we developed it with Lamania. Lamania went on to make that watch for the British military, which was a great watch, and I love it very much. So I thought I'd make my own one, um, which is asymmetric case, um, money pusher movement. Um, There's real family parallels. Or, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But I also love diving, and I always wanted to have a dive watch. So ah, the okay. M60 was always something I wanted to make. It was quite a long, drawn-out process, probably a four-year 
process. Going back to the core values, make it the best you can make it. So it's cost certified. It's Swiss ISO rated, which is quite a thing in itself. 600 meters water resistance, which is slight overkill, but it's it's what I wanted. It's again, insane luminosity, all that sort of thing that launched beginning of last year in date and no date versions. So interesting belly case. It's very slim for a, a okay. 600 meters water resistance. It's 14 mil, whereas if you think a black bay is 14.6. So it's, it's, it's pretty thin. It uses the same molded superluminova technology that we use in our other watches. Other interesting talking points is the bezel design is taken for the rear side adjuster of a Bren gun. It just works. And that site was designed to be turned and held and and that sort of thing. And it, it transposes really well to the bezel lever. What you had me on Bren gun. <laughs> I know. And it's it, it's it's that sort of thing you get to do. Yeah, I guess tell those fun stories and, and think about interesting ways to do things. And is this uh, a rubber insert? Uh it's, it is. It's a it's it's a metal and rubber buffeted buffeted insert. Well, it's funny when when um John, the uh, the boss here, um, showed me his Aqualine. Um, I came up with an observation on it, uh, which um, was not something you intended, but it, it may be interesting to you that it was one of the things that leapt out at me, was your choice of marking from the uh, 12 to the 15 position on the bezel. Yeah. When I saw that there, which is very distinctive, and right now there'll be a close-up of it on video, um, I saw a rangefinder and a sniper scope. Right. The one of the ones that takes you from one yeah. right down to a thousand. And I wondered, was that inspiration for it? Because if not, it's a really nice coincidence. Yeah, that's that is unfortunately a coincidence. Right. Um, okay. Never mind. So there are other things that if we go back to the M one hundred, um mm. there are two red dots above the twelve position. Yes. There's the same on the MP forty five. They were taken from the iron sights of of a rifle. The original watch did have two dots, but they weren't um, contrasting. Mm -hmm. Now on the M100, uh, on the M60, sorry, I couldn't put them on the dial without it looking a little bit forced and I couldn't fit them on the bezel. So I've hidden them under the clasp on the, on the back of the strap. Are they going to appear on every watch? Yeah. Okay. And, and, and that's, that's again, it's sort of accidental design language that sort of arrives as you build things. When was this released? Sorry. Uh, beginning of last year. Okay. And any plans to make any other models of it? Because obviously you've got a couple of M100s. Yeah, there's, there's, there'll, there'll be some other things coming in the future. I dot, 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 dot. <laughs> okay. um, but realistically, we have quite a long design and, and you know, we, because of the way we make watches, we can't, we don't do 60 different dials a year right. or, you know, we'll do maybe two different dials a year or two different watches a year. We're, we're not in a rush. Um, and we like that. I like that. I, I, I want you to understand that the watch you bought is precious to us as yes. it is to you. Other interesting story for you as a, a strap person. Um, there are two lug pin positions on the watch. So there are. Um, so one, if you've got a strap, like a rubber strap or the steel strap, and you want it close to the case. But yeah. one, if you want a NATO, say you want a bit more space around it so you can reposition lug pins, which is something I wanted. That's a lovely design element. Um, are, are you, have you got different strap options for that? Yeah, so it, within the watch itself you it comes with um uh, a rubber strap and a zulu alpha um sort of dive strap right um there's the singer stitching again that i was talking about oh kind of, yes um, it's got that real military handbook yeah like. um and it's it's you know you get to play with all that that storytelling that's taken years yeah. to to build right um, yeah I, I think it's really interesting just, because again you, it there is a real sensation that you're getting a piece of I wouldn't say standard military equipment with this. I yeah. would say it's more a piece of specialist yeah. equipment. Well, thank you. Um, but for me, it's about respecting the history, respecting what you, the story you're telling. Yeah. You know, it's 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 as much the owners as it is ours. And and I love that wearing a vertex sort of empowers you to tell the story too, and you can be part of that. And you know, occasionally I'll I'll get an email from someone who's like, I was just on the plane and the guy next to me was like, was that a vertex? And we ended up having this really long story and I told them all about it. And it's great that you can do that. Well, I think the thing is because of what you, because of the design concept you've gone with, especially with the raised superluminova, it's instantly recognizable. Mm. And as we know only too well, it is quite difficult to achieve that yeah. in, in any, any wristwatch. Yeah. I mean, but, visual identity is really important, but visual identity without being, OTT or, or, or complicated is, is, yeah. is, you know, but it's also amazes me, amazes me that we do have visual identity in watches. I mean, your watch, 
is a round circle with hands and mine is a round circle with hands on it. Um, they're in a tiny amount of space, but they look completely different mm. and they all look completely different. I find that fascinating. It's a fascinating the diversity you can have within such a small space yeah. that's basically doing the same job. Well, I think that that you could you could you could bring that argument then to the dirty dozens and the A11s for that yeah. matter. Everybody's faced with the same military spec, and then you've got this different interpretation of that spec. Yeah, and you can see looking at the dirty dozens, some are more elaborate than others, yeah. some are much more simple and clinical than others. Yeah. Yet they all fell within that specification. I think that's what because if, I guess if there were twelve watches that were ab, I mean absolutely identical. It, yeah. it would have it would be a less interesting collection. It would be a less interesting And story. I think that one of the joys of looking at these collectives is the the different interpretation of it. And I think what's so interesting here is how you've stayed so true to that. Yeah. E- even dare I say it within the M60. Yeah. There is that DNA that's come through from Vertex and it's rather than it's Vertex reborn, I kind of see it more of a just an evolution of what happened yeah, through the war. Yeah, for sure. War I mean, era. the dial design was taken from a dive watch you made in the 50s. So yeah. I like I think everything we make to have some authority to exist, that, that it was part of our story. Mm. Um, but after that, you just get to play with it and work with it and that sort of thing. And, and that's really fun. Are you allowed to give us even the slightest suggestion? I mean, don't worry, we can slap a top secret label on this. No, nobody's listening. What, 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 where's your vision? Where do you want to take the company now? And maybe what models might you be thinking about in the future? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's fun making new things and it's fun developing the company. Um, you know, at the same time, I, I I like us not being too big. I like us, you know, being able to know every one of our customers and be able to be part of their story and then be part of our story. We're looking at doing a ladies' watch for a number of reasons, but I think that could be quite exciting. We'll probably show that at, at the end of this year. We will do a 36 mil version of the M100 eventually, or a or, or reissue, if you like, of the um, Dirty Dozen watch. Okay. Because um, we are asked for that a lot. And then I can see why. The, the, there's yeah. obviously a couple of things missing in our portfolio the sports crane and a GMT. Mm-hmm. So they are. They're in the works. A GMT would be nice. Yeah. This is an amazing collection of watches. I think the the, the lineage and the heritage, you're, you kind of summed it up right at the beginning. It gives you goosebumps. And that doesn't happen that often in this industry because there is so you. much generic stuff out yeah. there. I mean, the nice thing yeah. we get to do is we get to tell our story. Yeah. So all our watches are based on our story and things that our watches did. And that's a nice place to be. I think that's a perfect place to end. Again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming along. I really hope we thank can you. do this again sometime. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you very much for staying with us. This has been a fascinating chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and to the magazine, and we'll be back really soon with some more great video content.